tonight, though. You guys are all anxious. Um, we're we have a great presentation here. Scandinavians in Wisconsin, or it's all about the Pinery Boys. So Professor Jim Leary is a professor of folklore and Scandinavian studies. Who knew? Um, at UW-Madison. He was born and raised in uh, Rice Lake, Rice Lake, northern Wisconsin. Um, and he's been fascinated by his neighbors' uh, stories and their accents ever since he was a little kid. So since the 70s, Jim has done field work and archival research on the people of the upper Midwest. This has led to folk life festivals, museum exhibits, and lots of other events and publications. Recently, Professor Leary has been working on a new book and a multi-CD compilation called Folk Songs of Another America, Field Recordings from the Upper Midwest, 1937 to 1946, to feature digitally restored examples of old time lumber, lumber camp performances throughout the northern Wisconsin and the UP. So, now, Professor Leary has written many books. Here is your trivia question for the night. Which one of these did he not write? Yodeling in Dairyland. That's number one. Number two. Number two. So, Ole says to Lena. Number three. Cooking with Norwegian bachelor farmers. Or four. Pokabilly. He has written three of these. <laughs> great titles, great titles. So what do you think? Is it Yodeling in Dairyland? No. So Ole says to Lena? Yeah. Cooking with Norwegian bachelor farmers? Yeah. Pokabilly? Yeah. Cooking with Norwegian bachelor farmers. Maybe a future book. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Jim Leary. Thanks a lot. As a Rice Lake guy, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be up, up where it's cold and we don't have any snow at all now down in Mount Horeb or, well, about that much. So I, uh, Louis Road called to me as I drove up here and uh, it seems like the mic needs adjusting. So I was out cross-country skiing. I got up here at about noon and, and it's also very nice to be somewhere where I can have a, have a beer while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> There are, there are a couple of, of, of handouts. Uh, I'm going to play some examples of uh, tunes uh, and a few songs from uh, this recent project that Susan mentioned. And I've got lyrics for a few things. There aren't enough to share, but uh, I don't know. Let's t Tom and Susan maybe uh, distribute them around. And then if any of you are interested, uh, this, this project that Susan mentions, uh, Folk, folk songs of another America, field recordings from the Upper Midwest, 1937 to 1946, is a, it's it's a book uh, about 450 pages with about almost 100 illustrations, five CDs with uh, 175 songs and tunes, um, and uh, a film on, on DVD that's restored from silent film footage uh, and sound recordings that Alan Lomax made. Uh, mostly in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but also with, with some Wisconsin performers in 1938. And that's a, a DVD, and, and they're all going to be put out in one, uh, one big package. Um, so I, I have a handout about that as well, and they're, they're up here if any of you are interested in that. It should be out in, uh, in April. Uh, and this project actually ha has to do with recordings made in, in this region in the 30s and 40s. Most of them uh, have been completely unknown for decades because uh, most of the recordings were in languages other than English. If any of you spend any time in this region, you know that there are lots of indigenous people, you know, um, Ojibwe's, uh, Oneida, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Potawatomi, uh, there are all sorts of people who came from different parts of Europe, especially speaking languages other than, than English, um, or came from, from Canada in the case of French Canadians. Uh, and this project has songs in uh, Lithuanian, uh, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, uh, Icelandic, Finnish, uh, Quebecois French, uh, Walloon French, as sung by the Belgians, uh, Dutch, uh, 
Germans, uh, Swiss Germans, uh, Austrians, Italians, a uh, few more than I'm, Scots Gaelic singers, uh, Irish singers, and, and, and a lot more. Uh, tonight I'm really going to focus more on, on stuff in English and stuff from uh, songs and tunes from the lumber camps. But during the question session, if any of you are curious about uh, some of these other songs, uh, I've got a whole lot of them on my computer. And thanks to Noah, we can jack my, my Mac is jacked into the sound system, so we should be able to hear some, some cool stuff. But I, I grew up uh, in, in Rice Lake. I was born in 1950. And... Uh, there was a wonderful old-timer in my home community, a guy born in 1895, Otto Rindlisbacher, who uh, ran a place called the Buckhorn Tavern. It was a classic up-north museum bar with uh, all kinds of stuffed animals uh, in it, uh, including ones that were imaginary. He had uh, uh, the shovel-tailed snow snake and the owl-eyed ripple skipper and the, the dingbat, which was an owl with uh, antlers and uh, uh, the fur herring in there. But he also had on the wall the world's largest collection of odd lumber camp musical instruments. And he was a, a formidable musician himself. He could play the, the Schweitzer hand orgelie, the Swiss button accordion. Uh, that was his, his own um, parentage. Um, his parents were Swiss immigrants. But he, um, he was also a wonderful fiddle player. And because Rice Lake was a logging and, and sawmill town, um, he fell in with a lot of people who worked in the woods. He did a little bit of that himself. And those folks were French-Canadian. They were uh, Ojibwe. Uh, they were um, Czech. They were German. They were Polish. Uh, they were English, Irish. Uh, and he learned tunes from all sorts of people. But uh, Norwegians were especially prominent in the area. And in uh, the early 20th century, a uh, virtuoso accordion player named Thorstein Skarning came over from Norway, recruited Otto into a band. They toured around. Otto learned how to play Norwegian music, including how to make uh, Norwegian hardanger fiddles. And when I was a young kid, of course, I... I uh, I love going to taverns, <laughs> and uh, you know, occasionally I, I I could go along with with my dad on a, a Saturday afternoon, and uh, the the Buckhorn was a, an amazing place, full of all these animals, but also the instruments and various characters. And um, when I was uh, still pretty young, maybe ten or twelve, I discovered that there was a, a Library of Congress recording called Folk Songs. Uh, of Wisconsin in the public library, and on it were several tunes by Otto Rindlisbacher, but also by by some other people, and I was really kind of amazed by this. Uh, I was lucky, uh, kind of as a young kid in college, to find out that you could study folklore somewhere, and I, I got a master's uh, at North Carolina in folklore, and a PhD in Indiana. When I got my master's, my dad gave me 50 bucks, and I uh, uh, spent 25 on beer, but uh, <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> I'll take a drink here. <laughs> <laughs> but with the other 25, I, I bought, a, bought a cheap tape recorder and uh, a microphone from Sears. And when I got back to Wisconsin, I went down the road and uh, interviewed an old guy born in 1885, George Russell, who uh, had worked in lumber camps and farmed, uh, was an amazing storyteller. I, I heard a whole lot of uh, Pat and Mike jokes from him and also jokes uh, about Ole and Lena that he'd learned about 1900. But he also told me about um, uh, f fiddle, uh, um, fiddling in the lumber camps, uh, songs in the lumber camps, uh, and uh, about local house parties. And I was curious to learn more about that. Uh, I was very lucky um, in the late 1970s to um, uh, be asked uh, by Northland College to help them out with a grant to record life stories, uh, life histories, and, and music from various ethnic groups in uh, northern Wisconsin and the UP. And uh, so I, I spent a year, 1980-81, uh, uh, doing interviews with, with uh, mus musicians and recording songs and tunes from them, uh, began to produce some radio shows and records. And a few of these people, um, I found out 
later uh, had been recorded uh, back in the 1930s. There was a guy named John Shawbitz, a piano accordion player. Uh, he'd been a streetcar conductor, a Slovenian immigrant to Ironwood, Michigan. And in 1938, he was recorded for the Library of Congress by Alan Lomax. And I began to be curious ab about this. Um, in uh, 1928, uh, an entrepreneurial fellow named Robert Winslow Gordon, who had studied uh, folk songs as kind of literary forms at Harvard University, uh, became enamored of a new recording technology in the early 20th century, the cylinder recorder, uh, that you could, it was portable, you could take it out and make, make field recordings with these little wax cylinders. And he, uh, he was an entrepreneurial guy, uh, a bright thinker. Uh, he, there was a, a sort of a, a men's magazine at that time called Adventure Magazine, and he began to write a column, uh, kind of like what, what uh, Natalie and some of the science folks are, are doing with WXPR, you know. Uh, you, you do some sort of feature and put it out, out to the public. And, and this one was called Songs... Uh, it was kind of a, a, you know, a sexist or a gendered term. Song, old songs men have sung or something, as if women didn't do a, a lot of singing then as, as now. But he would write these columns and people would send him in songs. And then in some cases he would go out and make field recordings of, of some of them. And he talked the Library of Congress into being the repository for these cylinder recordings. He pretty much did it with private money and little by little... Um, it, the library began to realize that they had a, a stake in this, that uh, you know, there was a, a trove of cultural richness out there in, in America that could be found in, in songs. Uh, these pieces of, of poetry that you know, come out of the people and are, are shared by them. Um, and so when, when Winslow, Robert Winslow Gordon was ready to kind of step aside from that, uh, John Lomax came in. He had also studied at Harvard. He'd begun to be interested in, in cowboy songs. He'd grown up in Texas. And um, in 1933, when his son Alan was, was a, uh, eight, 18 years old, he took him, uh, Alan, along on a field recording trip where they uh, discovered Lead Belly, among other performers. And... Uh, by the late 1930s, Alan Lomax was the assistant in charge at the Library of Congress. Of course, this was during the Depression. There were a number of federal programs, and one person who got a, a position in the Roosevelt administration was, was Charles Seeger. Charles Seeger had been a, a tenured music professor at uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, but uh, during... Um, in, Right uh, in, in around 1915, uh, he was aware of the, the brutal conditions of farm workers and longshoremen and a lot of seasonal workers in, in California, something he'd never thought about before. Uh, but he became um, aware of them and um, in sympathy with the industrial workers of, of the world. When the United States entered uh, World War I, he opposed the war and he was um, kicked out of, of, of Berkeley uh, he, uh, you know, he made his living in different kinds of ways, but eventually, uh, by the 1930s, he was in the Roosevelt administration, uh, in the resettlement uh, administration, and his thing was to try to keep the spirits up of down and out people, especially displaced workers or workers in rural areas, by um, calling attention to the value and the importance of their, uh, their own songs and, and music. Uh, one of the people who uh, worked for him was a woman named Sidney Robertson. There's a long story about her, but I won't go into that. But she was based in, in Wisconsin. And uh, in Rhinelander, there was a fellow named Lee Sorden, who, uh, L.G. Sorden, grown up on a farm in Iowa, and he was uh, an extension person in, in Rhinelander. He had an interest in the lumber camps. And he was involved in establishing with a number of other people um, the uh, logging museum in Rhinelander. And um, because of his involvement with, uh, with extension and sort of uh, Roosevelt administration um, efforts to raise people's spirits and put them back to work, uh, Sidney Robertson was in touch with them, came up here and uh, began to make field recordings of lumber camp singers and 
and, and fiddlers. Uh, she spent um, a, only a short time uh, making recordings before she went back to California where she was from, but she wrote to Alan Lomax, who was then the assistant in charge of the Archive of American Folk Song at the Library of Congress, and said, you must come to to Wisconsin, uh, and you must come to the upper Midwest. Uh, Lomax was really excited about this. He and his father had been writing books um, with songs and tunes, uh, mostly in English, uh, in fact, almost entirely in English, uh, books like Our Singing Country, and he was especially interested in Great Lakes songs and songs from, from the lumber camps. Uh, but he was also aware of a lot of the ethnic diversity in, in this region, and so, Rather ambitiously, in 1938, uh, he uh, got $985 from the Library of Congress to do a, a three-month uh, sweep where he was going to try to record all the folk songs uh, in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota in, in three months. Uh, he wrote to different people in advance. Uh, he he kind of got hung up in the UP, uh, drinking a lot of beer and hanging out with Finns and French Canadians, m mostly. Uh, he spent about one day in Wisconsin on the Bad River Reservation at o Odena. And uh, I'm going to play you uh, one of the, the amazing recordings that, that he, he made there. There was a fellow there named, named Joe Cloud. His um, father had been a fiddler. He was, uh, was Ojibwe. Uh, and there's a long tradition of... Uh, fiddling and, and step dancing among native and, and mixed blood people in, in this region that came in with the fur trade and was certainly well established uh, in, during the lumber camp period. Uh, this field recording we're going to hear, made in 1938 in Odena, Wisconsin, uh, was made as a, were all of the recordings that we're going to hear tonight with a large disc cutting machine that, that sometimes had to run on on batteries. Uh, in fact, it mostly had to run on batteries, uh, although sometimes it could be plugged in. So it's a big bulky machine. Um, so Lomax was traveling around, as were Sidney Robertson and Helene Stratman Thomas, who we'll hear about in a moment, with um, this disc cutting machine, a bunch of uh, spare needles, a bunch of blank discs, a big bulky microphone on, on dirt roads and, and so forth. Um, the project I'm, I'm working on, we, we've digitally transferred uh, these uh, you know, from the deteriorating disk to digital format. Then we had to uh, try to take out as much noise as we could without cutting into the sound. We also had to equalize them because they were recorded at, at different levels. But another thing we've had to do was, was a speed correction because especially with Lomax's recordings, he was doing often with batteries and sometimes the stuff would be really fast and really slow. So when I play this, you can hear his voice is a little bit high, high pitched. And um, so on some of them, he, has, ha he knew this was going to be a problem. So on some, he, has, he, he, he plays a, um, a, like, a, like a pitch pipe. And so, so that uh, an engineer later on could get that a fix on that note. But with some of these, we don't have that. So what we have are some recordings of what we know what his voice sounds like, and then these ones where it's a little faster, and we we have to try to to ballpark this. So what you're going to hear isn't isn't restored, but the, what we're going to issue is restored. But this is Alan Lomax's announcement uh, from 1938. So. These fiddle tunes are being recorded by Joe Cloud in Odana, Wisconsin on October the 16th, 1938 for the Archive of American Folk Song in the Library of Congress. Mr. Cloud is 53 and uh, has uh, the blood of the Chippewa Indians uh, flowing in his veins. He has played the fiddle since he was 15 years old and uh, learned to play from his father who was also a fiddler. Okay, we'll hear a little bit of one, one uh, fiddle tune played by him. He played uh, four or five, uh, including uh, a duet with his son Clarence, who was a, a fine banjo player. And uh, the tune we're going to hear is, is Red River Jig, which is especially well known in, in Manitoba. It's, uh, it's uh, almost... Uh, the national tune of, of Metis people, and um, it's, it's often 
uh, danced in, in a style that is very much a, a sort of synthesis of jigging or step dancing that French and Irish uh, would do with um, the men's traditional dancing that one would see at, at a powwow with those kinds of movements. Uh, he also played uh, several, uh, as he called them, squaw dances, women's dances, which are, are drum songs, but he played drum songs on, on the fiddle. So it's a very interesting kind of cultural mix. But here, here's a little bit of Red River Jig. As I said, this was Alan Lomax's only visit in, in Wisconsin. And so he realized there was a lot to discover here. He wrote to uh, the School of Music at the University of Wisconsin to see if there was anyone who was willing to, uh, to do more field recording. There was a woman named Helene Stratman Thomas. Uh, she was born in, in Dodgeville, grew up there. Uh, her parents were, were German and, uh, and Cornish. And so she had heard German and Cornish songs there in that southwest Wisconsin. She'd also heard a lot of Welsh songs. And she was a, a very spunky person. She was willing to take this on even though she didn't have any training. Alan Lomax wrote her uh, a letter with sort of with instructions about what to look for, how, how to proceed, what kind of equipment to use. And uh, she got a little research grant from the graduate school at the University of Wisconsin in the summer of 1940. She went out, made recordings, sent them back to Lomax. He liked some, he critiqued others. Uh, she went out again in the summer of 41. And then after um, uh, gas and, and tire restrictions and so forth uh, in 1946, at the end of World War II, uh, she went out and made another uh, field trip. Um, one of the people that uh, she recorded uh, had also been recorded um, by S Sidney Robertson in 1937, the one who had encouraged Lomax. So there's a relationship between these three folklorists who made recordings for the Library of Congress. Uh, the person who Sidney had recorded uh, and who was also recorded uh, by Stratman Thomas was, was Lazy Brusso, a, a wonderful fiddler in Rhinelander. He was born in, in Quebec, uh, learned to fiddle there. We know that um, by the 1890s he was uh, living in Ironwood, Michigan. He got married there, uh, but um, soon after he was in Rhinelander. He was um, an avid hunter and fisherman, but he also r ran a dray line, uh, hauled, hauled freight, delivered freight roundabout, but mostly he loved, loved to fiddle. And um, in the 1940s, uh, he was retired, but he was a kind of a caretaker, janitor, fix-it-all person, a maintenance person at the, the Lum Lumbering Museum. He played with uh, a little local band, a uh, clarinet player and an accordion player. And this is a tune um, that he called Good, Good for the Tongue. It's a, it's a real um, showpiece of a tune. And he, he was a, a phenomenal fiddler in 1926 when... Henry Ford had sponsored old-time fiddle contests, uh, and there was a spate of old-time fiddle contests. Uh, the Chicago Herald Examiner uh, ran a contest for the champion of the Midwest, and it was won by Elaine Brousseau. And one of his um, perks for that was to tour on the vaudeville circuit and also to play with some bands on the WLS barn dance. And um, uh, Natalie Jablonski produced a, a nice feature that's up on WX. PR and there's a picture of Lazim in a in a cowboy outfit uh, with a, a group uh, called Rube Tri. Oh uh, well, no, it's called I can't think what the hell the name. Uh, so so and so and his Texas Cowboys, but it was actually led by a, a Norwegian from Amherst, uh, w w was Wisconsin, uh, wearing wearing a cowboy hat. But this this tune, good for the tongue. Uh, it's also known as as uh, Whitefish on the Rapids. It's, it's played by a lot of uh, 
Ojibwe fiddlers in the, the eastern UP and over toward Manitoulin Island. And um, it, uh, for them, it refers to the whitefish uh, uh, on, on the rapids there between La Lake uh, Superior and Lake Huron. And um, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a tune of, of tribute to the, uh, the fierceness of, of the whitefish as they move uh, across the rapids. But it's, it's, he, he plays the hell out of it. So let's listen. I'm just going to tease you by not playing the whole thing, but um, I, wa I want to respect the, the Q&A format, but I, I want to play one long song with, with words because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a superb song and a superb performance. Um, it's, it's sung by a guy named Emery Denoyer, who was of French-Canadian background. When he was a, a young boy, he was uh, injured in, in an accident and was, was blinded. Uh, came from a, a poor family. They'd lived for a while in Merrill and then uh, located in in, uh, in Rhinelander. But a very kindly and a loving family. And um, Emory had a good voice. And, of course, Rhinelander was a center for, a uh, supply center for a lot of lumber camps roundabout. And uh, I'm not sure who hit upon the idea, but but the idea was hit upon that, that he could go out with his brother guiding him to different lumber camps and, and sing. And somewhere he had acquired, by listening to old loggers, uh, a really great stock of lumber camp songs. Uh, he also bought one of the first uh, disc players, uh, Victrolas, in that era. Uh, in in Rhinelander and a stock of records and would take them out to lumber camps as well and they would sing for, for tips and he did this for many years. Uh, I've used newspaper search engines as well to find out about him and I found that in uh, the late 1940s, uh, or I, I guess it was, yeah, I think the late 1940s, he even sang with a, a group uh, that was calling themselves something like the Rhinelander Hepcats uh, for a, a CYO dance, a Catholic Youth Organization dance in, in Rhinelander. But um, the, the prevailing style of a cappella or unaccompanied singing in the lumber camps was, was Irish. Uh, Irish singers had entered in into the lumber camps uh, and so the kind of come all ye uh, structure of, of, of ballads uh, or narrative folk songs uh, that entered into the lumber camp traditions as long as, as well as the way of singing it unaccompanied in a kind of a uh, tenor style a little bit louder than your normal voice uh, was decidedly Irish and this particular song, uh, it's, it's on the sheet, it's called The Shanty Boy's Life, um, is a, a chronicle of working in the woods. And it's a song that's known in Canada, but also in the United States in, in logging areas. It's, 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 a, it's a tremendous song. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the Library of Congress's folk songs out of Wisconsin that Rounder Records reissued on CD maybe 20 years ago, uh, there's an incomplete version of this because the discs would only hold so much and this was a long song. Uh, this song is actually on two different discs. And um, for years I had thought that, you know, the song ended in the version that was heard on, on the Library of Congress disc. But in fact there are two more verses. And so um, the project that I'm coming out with will, will 
put the missing parts together. And we can listen to them now. This is a long song. And then after that, we'll have, uh, we'll have some discussion, and I can play, play more uh, recordings if you're interested. Okay, here we go. All you jolly fellows, come listen to my song. It's all about the pinery boys and how they get along. They're the jolliest lot of fellows, so merrily and fine. They will spend their pleasant winter months in cutting down the pine. Some will leave their friends and homes, and others they do love dear. And into the lonesome pine woods their pathway they do steer. Into the lonesome pine woods all winter to remain, are waiting for the springtime to return again. Springtime comes, oh glad will be its day. Some return to home and friends while others go astray. The sawyers and the choppers, they lay their timber low. The swampers and the teamsters, they haul it to and fro. Next comes the loaders before the break of day. Load up your sleighs 5,000 feet to the river haste away. Noontime rolls around, our foreman loudly screams. Lay down your tools, me boys, and we'll haste to pork and beans. We arrive at the shanty, the splashing then begins. The banging of the water pails, the rattling of the tins. In the middle of the splashing, our cook for dinner does cry. We all arise and go, for we hate to lose our pie. Dinner being over, we into our shanty go. We all fill up our pipes and smoke till everything looks blue. It's time for the woods, me boys, our foreman, he does say. We all gather up our hats and caps to the woods we haste away. We all go out with a welcome heart and a well-contented mind for the winter winds blow cold among the waving pine. The ringing of saws and axes until the sun goes down. Lay down your tools, me boys, for the shanties we are bound. We arrive at the shanty with cold and wet feet. Take off our overboots and packs. It's supper we must eat. Supper being ready, we all arise and go. For it ain't the style of a lumberjack to lose his hash, you know. At three o'clock in the morning, our bull cook loudly shouts. Roll out, roll out, you Teamsters, it's time that you are out. The Teamsters, they get up in a fright and manful way. Oh, where's my boots? Oh, where's my packs? My rubbers have gone astray. The other men, they then get up their packs they cannot find. And they lay it to the Teamsters, and they curse them till they're blind. Springtime comes, oh glad will be its day. Lay down your tools, me boys, and we'll haste to break away. The floating ice is over and business now to strive. Three hundred able-bodied men are wanted on the Pelican Drive. Okay, here's the missing part then. With jam pikes and peavies, those able men do go all up that wild dreary stream to risk their lives, you know. Cold and frosty mornings, they shiver with the cold. So much ice upon their jam pikes, they scarcely can them hold. Now, wherever you hear those verses, Believe them to be true, for if you doubt one word of them, just ask Bob Bunsen's crew. 
It was in Bob and shanties where they were sung with glee. And the ending of my song is signed C, D, F, and G. Melvin Seiden. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's a great performance. <laughs> So I've got a couple of other songs queued up. One uh, by Pearl Boreski uh, from a family of Kentuckians who came from eastern Kentucky, settled up around Anago, uh, also Kentucks around Crandon, and uh, sh she sings a little song I've got queued. I also have a, a song about uh, bad food and ha lice in Fond du Lac Jail. Uh, and then I have a, a song that, uh, that Alan Lomax uh, never succeeded in recording, although he tried to in Michigan, called the Red Light Saloon, about a, a trip to a, a, a sporting house or a, a whorehouse. And so, you know, he asked Helene Stratman Thomas if she could record some, some versions of this. And uh, she, she tried, but the lumberjacks got embarrassed. But, but she actually had a, a, an undergraduate student who was a an audio engineer and a music major along with her, a guy named Bob Drave. So she went out and waited in the car, and she ended up recording, or he did, three versions of Red Light Saloon. Um, so we can listen to that later if, if you want to. It has, uh, I should warn you, it has some bad words in it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, questions or, or, or comments or anything of the sort? Get the microphone? Oh, yeah. Thank you. And, and I can also uh, probably pretty easily pull up songs in Lithuanian or Scots Gaelic or Finnish or Ho-Chunk or <laughs> something like so that. So anybody who has a question, uh, just raise your hand and Carol will walk around. Um, I actually have two questions that are kind of related. One, the first one, was there, were there ever any women associated with these lumber camps? Uh, um, y y yes, uh, usually in, well... Uh, Other than the whores? Sport, the sport and house, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah in, 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 in some s small fam family-run camps, uh, you know, women, uh, you know, often the wife of the boss, or, or sometimes they were cooks and, and, and so forth. Um, sometimes on, on, on Sunday, uh, you know, when the men wouldn't work, different people would come and visit, tra traveling salesmen, preachers. Uh, uh, there were nuns who would sometimes go and, and uh, sell, like, hospital plans <laughs> to, to, to lumberjacks. So uh, on a very limited basis, and... Uh, a fair number of lumberjack songs are uh, about, uh, just like cowboy songs, about you know the misery of being away from one's wife or sweetheart, or having been spurned by a sweetheart, so they left, or how they wanted to go back and see mom. And uh, there's a classic one called the, the Jam on on Gary's Rock, uh, where the hero is the foreman, young Monroe, who has wavy hair, and he's dashing, and he's young, and he's brave, and he, he's in charge, and of course, he's, he's also uh, uh, tries to break up the log jam, and, and he's, he, you know, when he's on it, he says in classic stilted ballad language, uh, uh, you better be on your guard, my boys, for the jam will soon give way, and, which it does, and he's beheaded, and his head rolls onto the stream, and immediately uh, the, uh, the air is rent with cries from his, his sweetheart, who, who maybe was, uh, I mean, sometimes people actually would, uh, if the log jams were being broken up, like the St. Croix would fill up near Stillwater, for example, and so, you know, people could watch this as a, almost like people going out to the Battle of Bull Run and having picnics, you know, to watch the first battle of the Civil War. So in the ballad, his sweetheart appears right, right away, and um, then a collection is taken up for her and, of course, her, her widowed mother. So, so there's a lot of uh, uh, 
imaginary presence of women let, let, or longing that, that occurs in, in, in these so, songs. So the second half of my question then is how long would these men be in a logging camp? How yeah. many months duration would they well, be Well, you, you know, the, there would sometimes be an early crew to go in if, if a camp had to be built, but, but uh, as, as the phrase would go, the, the boys would go into the woods when, as, when there was snow and the ground was, was frozen because the logs ha had to be moved with you know, ox teams or ho horses and human power and uh, rutted I ice roads with, with teams. And, uh, you, you know, in the 19th and very early 20th century, so they needed that frozen ground. And so, you know, you'd, you'd work... Uh, then as long as you could into the spring, depending on how long the the winter lasted, and and then when the ground started to soften up, and and also the ice, because sometimes you had to you know, move the logs onto the ice, or even take a, sl a sleigh across across a lake to get to a river where the the white pine especially could could float down down to a mill. So um, it you know three months. Uh, sometimes uh, where, where you'd be away and, and that was uh, you know it, it was often if, if someone was farming then um, uh, in 1975 I taught my first folklore class it was uh, UW Barron County and I had I was very lucky to have in the class a guy in, in, in his 80s uh, who had worked in the woods but he'd also done interviews with old loggers a guy named Ward Winton and he published a bunch of those and I remember reading some poignant accounts of, of women who were left you know by their husbands and their old son older sons who could do the work because that was the way you know you could earn cash in the woods and so often the um, you know if there was a, a wife she would be left with uh, the young children uh, you know, at, by herself for, for several months in, in in the winter. So it was, it was a really a, a kind of a society of its own for a prolonged time, and it really wasn't until roughly after World War One that that it began to to change. And there there were still lumber camps uh, well into the the fifties even, and and even longer in parts of of the UP. But uh, often people could could wouldn't have to stay there either. They could they could drive to them as as well and also the you know the nature of the timber uh changed by then because the first crop had all been been cut so yeah you may have mentioned this already um where did Lo alan lomax come from well his um he, he was born in, in in texas uh his his father uh was born in mississippi and had moved to Texas as, as a young boy. His father said he was from the, uh, the, the upper crust of the poor white trash. And, and uh, uh, so, so John Lomax, Allen's father, um, grew up actually along the, the Chisholm Trail. He went to University of Texas as, as a, a young man. And that's where Allen started out at University of Texas. And then he, uh, he went to Harvard for a while, but he was... Uh, he was, you know, he was um, an I idealistic uh, young person influenced by, by Freud and Marx in, in, in the 1930s. Uh, his father was very much an old, uh, kind of an old Southern um, paternalistic so sort of a person. And Alan, Lo Alan was very much a, a kind of a, a political radical and also a, uh, a whole lot of other, <laughs> other things too, a very complicated person. But... Um, uh, Basically, he was he, he was a Texan and a, a, a Southerner, uh, although he spent time in, in New York City. But a lot of his his uh, most um, uh, well known and and perhaps richest fieldwork was was in the American South in Mississippi and Alabama. He also did fieldwork in, in Haiti. Uh, he was he was um, um, wasn't exactly blacklisted, but he was on a a uh, there was a publication called Red Red Channels, uh, identifying uh, uh, communists and fellow travelers in in the media. Uh, that was published in in the late 1940s, and Alan had been 
involved with um, different people on, on the left and with labor unions, and he was also involved with Henry Wallace's Progressive uh, Party um, presidential campaign in 1948. Wallace had been uh, FDR's vi vice president, and so he kind of knew the handwriting was on the wall, and, and he went, uh, went, went to Europe and worked for the BBC and then also uh, worked for Columbia Records, uh, and then he kind of came back, Atlantic Records brought him back in the 50s. But he was... Um, he was amazed by the upper Midwest, and uh, he wrote uh, in many ways, and this is when he'd already been through all the American South as well as in Haiti. He said in many ways this was the richest and, and most interesting country he had ever been in. He was just astonished, and he actually prepared very well for his trip. He, he knew... He even, uh, you know, I've looked at a little, uh, he had little road maps with notes. He, he knew about uh, Mukwa up there near, you know, it means bear in Ojibwe, but, you know, it's up near Ashland. He knew that there were Czechs and Slovaks up there, and, and uh, he wanted to visit uh, the, uh, uh, he knew about the Industrialisti, the, the Finnish Industrial Workers of the World um, newspaper published in, in Duluth that often had uh, labor songs, uh, by, by, in Finnish in there, and uh, he, he'd written to people in, in advance. So he was, uh, you know, in some ways a citizen of the world, although kind of grounded in the South, but with a, a deep love of American kind of vernacular, you know, folk music. Yeah, Do I need that, or can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, I, don't like to, I don't like talking in the microphone. You talk so people online can hear oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, generally speaking, how much of this stuff was, how much improvisation was there? How much was this really true to songs? How much, like, hybridization do they see from old tunes that get, you know, improvised, whatever? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Uh, yes to all of that. All of that. Uh, you know, all sorts of different things were happening. Uh, uh, improvisation... Uh, you know, with 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 instrumental musicians, uh, you heard Lazy and Brusso play. He, he did little little trills and little ornaments uh, when he was working through the, the phrases uh, of of that fiddle tune. Uh, so he certainly some instrumental musicians did that, although it was it was not it, it was um, what would you say kind of incremental kind of improvisation where, you know, you wouldn't go off into a, a, a whole new, you wouldn't be space jamming like <laughs> the Grateful Dead or <laughs> something like that. Uh, you know, you would work within the framework of the tune, but you would introduce different variations. But people did mashups, <laughs> you, you might call it, of, of different tunes, and, uh, and you found really interesting hy hybridizations. I mean, um, in this project I'm working on, I have a great recording made in Newberry, Michigan by a, 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 a Finnish guy where he's using uh, the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic and he's singing a song in Finnish about uh, uh, various prophets and, and St. Peter and saints getting together in heaven to, uh, to drink and play, play music and sing, which is n what, not what any of the, the church Finns would want to do. This is sort of like a, a red fin thi thing to do. Uh, or there was a guy named Frank Mackey from Amasa, Michigan, who, who sang uh, a song called uh, Mary Poika um, about, a, about a sailor. Uh, and it's, it's to the tune of um, When the Work's All Done This Fall, uh, a, a cowboy song about a wandering cowboy, you know, separated from his, his, his mother. Um, so you, you find these kind of interesting mixtures that, that, are, that are going on um, that, you know, I think speak to uh, the fact that you had all kinds of people who, who may um, have settled in little clusters of Croatians or Finns or Czechs or whatever, but uh, their neighbors were kind of a mixture. They worked with different people in the lumber camp or farm work in a factory. Uh, they picked up the different lingo. If you were an active musician, there was a guy named Charles Kedvertis who uh, was Lithuanian. He played Lithuanian tunes, but he also played Irish tunes. He played Finnish tunes. Um, there was another Polish guy, uh, uh, 
who, who sounded just like Viola Turpin and the great Finnish uh, uh, accordion player playing a, a fast Finnish polka. So there was a lot of kind of mixing around that, that went on, and sometimes mixtures of, of language, too. Um, there were several singers who sang songs that mixed um, French, uh, or Quebecois French with, 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 with English, uh, for, for example. Or there were, there were interesting examples of uh, Christian Oneidas who had um, gone from Oneida, Wisconsin to the Hampton Institute in Virginia, which was set up for freed slaves. Um, and that's uh, one of the, the places, one of the hearths for quartet singing, that kind of harmonized part singing. And so they began to um, sing um, in Oneida Christian hymns in fundamentally an African-American influenced part singing style. <laughs> so lots of cool stuff. <laughs> Did that get at your question? Uh, all right, or, or yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I purchased uh, uh, vinyl uh, Wolf River songs. Oh yeah. And out of curiosity, my wife's grandfather is on there, and she has not seen a single royalty check. I, oh, oh, yeah. I'm wondering, were these people, was this in the public domain since the time that Robertson <sighs> recorded yeah. these? Or it's, did it's, they sign off on it? Or, I mean, it's kind of a weird question. But Well, no, it's... it's him and his friends up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. And, and, uh, uh, well, it, I don't know how many copies of that recording are sold. I, I have, I bought one too. Uh, and uh, that was done by, by Folkways recordings that, that Mo Ash um, had. Well, that's a, uh, that's a hard, hard question to answer because, because uh, Smithsonian uh, has taken over the Folkways catalog and what Mo Ash, I mean he was, uh, yeah, you know, with this, with this thing, I mean, that's something I'm, I'm trying to, to face with this because um, uh, the Library of Congress has, has, has set, said to me that that I can I can put these recordings out, but I need to make a good faith effort to get in touch with with um, next of kin, and so these are recordings that are made, uh, you know, 75 or so years ago, and so who's who is the next? Um, First, can you find someone in the first place? And if you can, maybe there are 30 next of, of kin. Um, so, and for me, it, it's taken me a lot of time. I've tried to track down people, and I've, I've, I'm slowly starting to contact them, asking them. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, it's, very, it's very quirky to establish that because of the way uh, Sony and record companies have Set, set things up. Um, so it's the songs themselves, unless they were composed by the people, in most cases they weren't. The songs are in the public domain, but the performances are owned by the performers. And so what I've tried to do when I can contact Next of Kin is to ask if they can, um, if they would just grant me the permission to put this out. And um, actually to do this project, I've, I've raised about a hundred thousand uh, dollars because it, it cost uh, about fifteen thousand dollars to to do the digital transfers the um, sound restoration and the speed correction and uh, and then uh, I raised money for the production cost so we're we're actually selling this uh, 400 page book plus five CDs and a, a DVD for six sixty dollars uh, which you know is kind of an it won't, uh, we, we raise enough money up front that we can kind of cover the costs and the idea is to kind of get it out there. And I, I think that was what, you know, I think that's what uh, Sidney Robertson was trying to do with Wolf River Songs. And and I, I know she had a, a long relationship with the, the, the Ford Walker family from the Crandon area because she recorded them 
first in 37, but, but she continued to make recordings up until the mid-1950s, including recording Ward Ford and some others when they were out in California. And so, I, you know, I think there was probably a good faith uh, sort of... <laughs> It's okay to do it. Uh, and I know Sydney didn't, I mean, she didn't make it. Mo, Mo Ash didn't pay any money to anybody, but he kept everything in print. Yeah, I, I understand. No, I understand, but it's a serious, it is a serious issue. Can you play a tiny bit of Steve's grandpa-in-law? Who is that? Robert Walker. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. I tell you what, folks, let's take a quick break and okay. we'll come back with I'll, that. Yeah, You'll I'll, have I'll a chance to find up. it. Yeah. Okay, take a, a five minute break. Don't forget to ask your pretzels in beer dip. We're set. Okay, folks, we're coming back. Everybody, if you can take your seats. <laughs> Thank we'll you. start up again. <laughs> we're ready to go. Folks, if you can grab a drink and settle down, and we'll start up again. Is it working? Hmm? Just say something. Okay, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to play a little bit um, of that request. This is uh, Rob, Rob Walker. And Rob Walker was a, a logger in the Crandon area. He sang very much in, um, in an Irish style, and... Um, I think I'll just play a couple of verses of this, but this this is a long ballad called The, the Lost Jimmy Whalen, and it's actually uh, has to do with a real historical incident, a guy named James Phelan, uh, sometimes pronounced Whalen, uh, in uh, Ontario, around Perth, Ontario, was, was drowned in a logging accident. And this is a song about his sweetheart coming to the banks of the river and summoning his, uh, his spirit up from the grave. And... Uh, it comes up reluctantly and gives her a, a kiss from its cold lips and so forth. Uh, but it's sung very much in an Irish style. I'll, I'll play just uh, a couple of verses of this. And then I think, uh, I think since I mentioned this, we, we should listen to the, the song about uh, the terrible food in Fond du Lac jail and also the red light saloon about the, the trip to the sporting house. Uh, so here's a little bit of Rob Walker. As slowly and sadly I strayed by the river, a watching the sunbeams as evening drew nigh. As onward I rambled, I spied a fair damsel. She was weeping and wailing with men's sighs, sighing for one who is now lying lonely, sighing for who no mortal can save For the dark rolling water flows sadly around him As onward it rolled o'er young Jimmy's grave Jimmy said she won't you come to my arms And give me sweet kisses as oft times you've done You promised you'd meet me this evening my darling Oh, come, dear, if Jimmy must come from your grave. Okay, so she conjures him from, from the grave. Um, Robert Walker was a, a great singer, and a couple of songs uh, I really like by him on Wolf River songs uh, have to do with complaints about prohibition. <laughs> it's one of them. And another one, one of them is a complaint about uh, uh, a guy named Wallace Waite who... Uh, ran a local uh, mill or something like that and didn't like to, to feed the people very well. It's uh, uh, work all day, no sugar uh, in your tay when you're working on the weight boys roll away. And there's, a, there's actually a, a guy named Brian Miller who is um, uh, reviving some of these old lumber camp songs. Uh, he has a great uh, website called Evergreen Tradition and he, he's done a couple of CDs of uh, lumber camp songs from Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. He's from Bemidji. But um, this is another song of complaint, and it's actually one that kind of goes back to, to England, and it's, it's found throughout the United States uh, where, you know, working people then as now, if they're part of the underclass and are itinerant workers, uh, 
Sometimes they're vagrants. <laughs> they get thrown in jail, targeted. And uh, this is about, sung by a guy named Charles Robinson, who actually worked on, on the Wolf River. And um, I don't know whether he ended up in the Final Act jail or not, but that's what this song is about. In the morning you receive a dry loaf of bread, as hard as a stone and as heavy as lead. It's thrown from the ceiling down into your cell, like coming from heaven popped down into hell. Oh, there's hard times in Fonzalac jail, there is hard times, I say. Your bed is made of old rotten rugs, you get up in the morning all covered with bugs. And the bugs, they will swear that unless you give bail, they're bound to go lousy in Fonzalac jail. There's hard times in Fonzalac jail, there's hard times, I say. Okay, it's just a short little song. Uh, I, okay, I promised one about the, the Red Light Saloon, this um, song that Alan Lomax couldn't find, but uh, there were three versions recorded here in Wisconsin. It's on, on the lyrics are on the sheet there. Um, this particular version was sung by a guy named John Christian, who uh, was actually born in Ireland. Uh, he was a very old man at the time he was recorded. You can hear a little bit of his, his brogue. He's kind of a faint singer, but he does a nice version. Uh, this song probably originated in, in Michigan, uh, ar around, around Muskegon, and uh, there I found a little bit of historical evidence uh, about some of the sporting houses there, but um, this is the song. Come on, you young fellows, I'll sing you a song. You pay good attention, it won't take me long. I sing you a song while fortune on me fell while taking a stroll to the White Hotel. Cause in the last days of the month of July, I can make good connection with the train I did try. While at Muskegon, I was left there to do and pay a last visit to the Red Light Saloon. I boldly walked in and stepped up to the bar, and a pretty young damsel says, have a cigar. I took a cigar and sat down in a chair. Finally, this maiden came trickling round there. She boldly walked up and sat down on my knee. Saying, you are a fine lad and that I can see. You are a shanty boy, for that I well know. For your muscle is hard from your head to your toe. Then she played with my mustache and curved with my hair. My whole boy got ugly, I vow and declare. And jumping right up, laying my cigar down, says I am a pretty fair man, let us go have a round. Then she took me upstairs to her bedroom we went. Shutters were pulled down and at it we went. I pulled out my dodger and I gave her the shot. Such glorious feeling down heaven above. I bowed up my back while my dodger did play. And then on her belly, a panting I lay. And she struggled my mustache, and on me did smile. Send you up, river bummer, you got me with child. And I've only rolled off, and the sweat it rolled down. To wash off my dodger, she quickly flew round. With some soap and some water to wash out her hunt. While tripling downstairs, another victim to hunt. Now come all you young fellows, my song at this song. And if you ever your chance to Muskegon to run, Go seek this fair damsel, she's a rose in full bloom. She fucks for five dollars in the red light saloon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that, that prompts a, a curious curiosity here. As, as you uh, did your search for the audio, did you come across any interesting um, the visuals, uh, film. Y yes, um, I mean there were there were a lot of still still photographs, but um, Alan Lomax rather remarkably um, took along with him a, a, a Technicolor camera. Color film was pretty new then, in 1938, and uh, he had a he had a big heavy silent film projector, uh, so he. He did silent film footage. We have some evidence that some of his film was stolen at one point. But um, I, I discovered this film footage in, in the 70s and uh, thought originally it was black and white. I, I was only able to see a, a copy of it. Uh, we recently had it a couple of years ago 
restored and found out it was, you know, it was color film. Um, and the trouble was when he was doing field work, he did not do very good documentation. Sort of, I mean, he was doing all the recording, he was doing the filming, he was talking to people. Uh, he kept some notebooks. Uh, they were kind of shifty a little bit or, or um, uh, you know, fragmentary. Uh, and so I had to work with a lot of internal evidence and kind of guesswork to figure out who was in the film. And sometimes we had photos or next of kin and we could verify it. And then we had to try to figure out well, what recordings Lomax made that we can match up with this. And uh, so that took a lot of work trying to figure that out. And then the film uh, itself, you had short excerpts. And so at any, any rate, to make a long story short, we, we made a, a almost a, about a 25 minute film based on this silent film footage, matching it up with um, the sound recordings. Uh, I had someone who was also an East Texan like Lomax read from his correspondence and field notes for voiceover. We found some other still images to, to cut into it. And um, so we've, we've made, it, made a film. And um, it's kind of amazing that that footage was there in the first place. Thank you. I noticed you focused on the dates 1937 and 1946. Um, why those particular dates? Well, why, not, why not 47? Well, that was, that was when these recordings w were made. Uh, uh, Sidney Robertson made recordings in 37, Alan Lomax in 38. Then he wanted someone to do work in Wisconsin. Stratman Thomas did it in 40, 41, and then follow up after the war in 46. And then that was, that's what went to the Library of Congress, th those materials. So that's kind of what I'm working with because those three people are connected. And, and uh, in some cases, I mean, there was even one person, Otto Rindlisbacher, from my hometown, who was recorded by all all three. So there's a kind of a relationship, and so that's you know that's that's why, really. Hey again, you've probably seen the movie Oh Brother Where Out Thou," and the the song that you played with regard to the jail and the Fond du Lac Jail sounds an awful lot, or it sounds very similar to the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Oh. From, and is that, is that an, a jail thing, an Irish thing, a yeah. decade thing, um, or, yeah? You know, I'll, I'll see if I can t make a short, short answer. The, you know, the, the Big Rock Candy Mountain is, is a song about uh, a, a poor person's paradise, a, you know, a land of milk and honey. And um, in, in Europe and probably other places in the world, there has been this, this imaginary notion, this legendary notion of a place where people could eat and drink and they wouldn't be oppressed and they wouldn't have to work too hard and they, they could enjoy life. And... Um, the Germans call it Schlaraffen land. Uh, sometimes in England it's called the land of cocaine. Um, and so the Big Rock Candy Mountain is kind of a ho hobo's version of it, uh, you know, where the, uh, the railroad bulls aren't going to beat you up and, and you, you can eat and drink. The, the um, great uh, uh, Norwegian um, virtuoso violin player and, and kind of social visionary uh, Ola Bull uh, financed uh, uh, a failed utopian community in Pennsylvania called Oleana, and a uh, Norwegian journalist wrote a, wrote a song that um, Pete Seeger and others have have sung versions of called Ole Oleana about you know how the pigs are gonna just run run around uh, with forks in their back saying eat me and the pancake trees and there's. Uh, uh, you know, uh, rivers of wine, and and even Merle Haggard back in the 70s did did a a song called uh, uh, "When the President Goes to the White House and d Does What He Says He'll Do, We'll All Be Drinking That Free Bubble Up and Eating That Rainbow Stew," and you know it it kind of harkens to th that idea. But the other side of that is complaints about um, terrible food and and bad conditions and being oppressed and and um, Certainly, in, in in lumber camps, you know there there was a a, a tradition of of songs uh, often called needles to, to to needle someone, and um, 
Irish singers and Irish Americans were especially good at that. Uh, in the Canadian Maritimes, there was a, a, a guy named, uh, what the hell, I, his name isn't coming to me, but uh, Larry Gorman. He was known as the man who made the songs. And, and sometimes he would make a song about someone who treated people poorly and it would just hound, hound people. Uh, uh, it would shame them, uh, like African griots shaming the king. And um, there was a guy who was recorded by Stratman Thomas who talked about a, a, a boss he had named Old Hazeltine, and he was on a lumber crew uh, logging around Wausau. And he said at the end of the drive, when they were all paid, they were in a saloon, and this Hazeltine came in there, and the boys cornered him, and they sang a song ridiculing him. Uh, Alan Lomax recorded one, and it's on my project. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, well, I'll try. To, I'm not a terrible singer, but I'll, I'll, I'll sing one verse. You know, our cook, she's the daughter of honest John Clark. One taste of her biscuits would make an ox fart. Her puddin's as tough and as green as the grass. And if you would taste it, you'd hock off your ass, dairy down, back for the die, oh diddle, oh day. But I guess the end. It ends up at the end with a curse. Uh, uh, yeah. Here's to Tad Mitten, that son of a bitch. May his bollocks ride off with a seven-year itch. His pecker will turn like the point of a screw, and his asshole will whistle the red, white, and blue dairy <laughs> down. And, 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 and that particular thing, uh, that's been an oral tradition for a long time. I've found versions of it uh, as an up yours to Saddam Hussein, for example. Uh, so... Um, uh, some of these things, I mean, Irish had a hand in it, but they've kind of been around. But, but again, you know, the, the, on the one side is the desire for this place where you don't work, people don't beat you up or ha harass you. You can eat and, and drink and, and live a wonderful life. And on the other hand, there are these complaints when things don't, don't happen that get expressed through, through, through songs. So, the, you know, they have a lot, I think they have a lot to te tell us. <laughs> uh, Th thank you very much. Uh, this has been a, a real treat. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Jim. That was just a fabulous presentation. Um, uh, thanks again to our sponsors, the Monaco Public Library, Trout Lake, uh, Kemp Natural Resources Station, uh, Lakeland, uh, the Badger, uh, Lakeland Badger chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association. And of course, thanks to our host, the Monaco Brewing Company. Thank you very much to all of you for coming out. Um, remember, our next Science on Tap will be Steve Deller talking about tourism and the Northwoods economy on February 4th. Uh, please sign up for email reminders if you are not on our mail email mailing list. Uh, please uh, fill out a form in the back as you're leaving. And we're always, always interested in uh, new topic ideas. We, uh, we gather every month to um, decide who we're going to get to speak next. So um, we uh, will look into all of your ideas. So thanks once again to Jim Leary for a, for a great presentation tonight. Thank you. Good night and stay warm.